our next presenter is Dr. Mark Peron, the Assistant Professor in the Plastics and Composites Engineering Department at Western Washington University. Dr. Peron researches biodegradable plastics, polymer characterization, and additives in plastics. He and his students do research to, among other things, um, help the Joint Center for Aerospace Technology Innovation, which develops solutions to help move aerospace forward in Washington State. Let's give a big hometown welcome for Dr. Mark Peron. Let me do a little uh, check on volume. How's that? Hearing? Yes? OK. A louder. Very good. <clears throat> um, so you can tell me in the back if you need me to go up a little higher. OK. I'm getting the cues. Um, I feel a little bit like the um, warm-up band who got put on after the headliner. <clears throat> Moreover, I'm between now and you getting your coffee break. So, and I'm going to pay you back by showing you lots of chemical structures, which I'm vibrating with delight. I can't speak for you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There we go. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of an introduction to plastics, where they come from, how they're made, and uh, what we can do with them. Kind of a long outline. This is intent intended to be very um, superficial um, and informative and educational, I hope. Um, so we're going to kind of skip along the, some of these topics pretty quickly. Um, OK. Chemical structures, how cool is that? Um, Western Washington University has um, a plastics and composites engineering program, and the nearest program where you can get a BS in plastics and composites engineering is in Massachusetts. So this is a rare major, and we have some, some special um, local um, knowledge in this area. Um, we, just three basic types of macromolecules I'm showing up here. The top one, uh, cellulosic typically from wood and plant fiber. Um, and you'll see the little dashed red lines are this extensive amount of attractive interaction between molecules and within molecules. It causes the material to have a lot of cohesiveness. It doesn't melt. Um, the second type, thermosetting materials, things like epoxies and other resins, are materials that essentially make a gigantic, three-dimensionally, chemically covalently bonded molecule. Think of a bowling ball in which it's just one molecule. That's essentially what that is. So what I'm going to talk about and focus on today, however, is the last one, which is thermoplastics, which is uh, the topic mostly of what Dr. Ross had mentioned. And thermoplastic materials are characterized and are the most ubiquitous industrially produced uh, plastic materials, and they are um, melt processable. That's the special feature I want you to focus on. Uh, this allows them to be manufactured in lots of different shapes, etc. Okay, <clears throat> so the molecule I'm showing up here is polypropylene. It's one of the most widely produced plastic materials in the world. Um, the Monomer is the building block of a polymer. You can see how the monomer shows up in the polymer structure and is repeated time after time after time after time. And the chain length of these pl plastic molecules are enormous. They can be thousands or tens of thousands of units long sometimes. And that gives them their unique features. So none, despite this tremendous length, they can be melted and allowed to deform under the influence of pressure and high temperatures and formed into the wide myriad of products. And this usually is done in an industrial reactor. This is not something you do at home. <clears throat> Polypropylene is uh, obviously very long chains. We talk about different types of polymers, homopolymers, the same monomer repeated again and again and again. But you can also do things like copolymerize it with other monomers. This gives rise to the huge variety of molecules that Dr. Ross mentioned, um, which is both a virtue and a vice. Um, these are very, relatively speaking, low density materials compared to 
um, some other naturally occurring substances, and, and especially compared to metals. These materials come in different grades, that is to say, different viscosities um, or thicknesses um, for different, and we take advantage of these different circumstances to match those with different manufacturing techniques to make the different products. For polypropylene, it's a relatively suitable material for recycling, though it's not recycled in very high rates. And it has poor um, kind of environmental degradation characteristics from light. So it tends to not survive outside really well, but it doesn't really go away, as we have learned. So in general, plastics, big long molecules, very alterable chemically, um, relatively low density compared to their, some of their mechanical and other performance measures. Melt processable, that defines a plastic to a large degree. They're environmentally stable. Another word for stability is persistence. And that's one of the things we've been learning about today and which I'm sure drives a lot of your interest. Um, so it's a virtue and a vice, again. Um, some materials are readily recyclable, others are less suited um, for various economic and technical reasons. Um, for some materials, they have good thermal performance, some others don't. So this uh, comparison could go on and on. And generally, they're quite hydrophobic materials. That is to say, water does not interact uh, favorably with them, and they tend to shed water, which makes them persistent in the environment. So one of the reasons that occurs. <clears throat> Uh, look at some quantities. This is from data from 2015, I found. Um, quantities, this is in millions of tons. Um, those are big numbers, in other words. Um, we'll define what these are on the right coming up. <clears throat> Low-density polyethylene and high-density polyethylene are at the top of the list. But these fibers that have become ubiquitous that we were just learning about are very uh, produced in enormous quantities across the globe. Um, so we're going to look at some more structures. You're going to get used to seeing a little of this. As you learn more about, about plastics, you necessarily start to look at chemistry. Um, so here is the repeating unit in polyethylene. And chemists sometimes get so tired of writing Cs and Hs that they, at the intersections of carbons, they just draw intersections. And they just, in their mind, they fill in the gaps with that structure. Saves time. <clears throat> Polypropylene, same kind of thing. You'll notice very repeated patterns, simple structures repeated again and again. Polyvinyl chloride, where it has a cl one chlorine in the repeating unit. Um, polyethylene terephthalate, very common in drinking bottles and other sources, and certainly in f uh, fabrics. This is the polyester fiber that is typically used in textiles. Not the only one, however. It's the only one we've seen so far that has this aromatic ring. So normally, these plastic materials have what's called an aliphatic ring, or aliphatic chain. These are flexible, and in contrast, when you start to introduce these aromatic rings in here, the material becomes stiffer, the chains become stiffer, the mechanical and thermal performance increases, um, and the environmental persistence usually gets worse. Not always. Polyurethanes have an aromatic functionality sometimes, not always, and an aromatic uh, functionality too. And then the polystyrenes, very ubiquitous with foams and other materials. Here's, instead of the aromatic ring in the chain, it's pendant to and dangling off of the main chain. Something like ABS, the S in ABS is styrene. It's acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. If you've ever played with a Lego, you know what ABS feels like. <clears throat> um, that's what they're made from. Um, so here's kind of a list of some of the big quantity materials. Here down here, here are all the bioplastics, all combined, down here in red. <clears throat> okay, so those are some pretty daunting numbers. Um, where the vast majority of uh, plastics comes from is from basic hydrocarbons, pet petroleum sources, either oil or natural gas. Um, here's a, the, a refinery down in Anacortes. So it's classic industrial chemical processing. And all the efficiencies 
and advantages and disadvantages that go along with that. Um, of the oil resources, about 4% of them go into plastics production. The vast majority goes into heating and transportation. So uh, when it comes to kind of the carbon footprint, plastics are significant, but by no means the biggest problem. They have their other difficulties. Um, let's look at some large use categories. Dr. Ross just talked about how much um, packaging material is thrown away every year. Um, packaging is the single largest um, use of plastics. In fact, if you look at the three largest categories together, about three quarters of all plastics are either packaging, construction, or in consumer goods. The consumer goods, some varying degrees of durability. Okay? So, are you being sent back in your chair with all this information? I hope, I hope so. <clears throat> you might not even need coffee after this. <clears throat> All right. Um, <laughs> that's true. I, had, I, got, I drink coffee before bed. Um, <clears throat> combining the production of plastics with their lifetime. So here you see um, a probability distribution function. This is a distribution of lifetime on this axis. So things like packaging you know, is used within a couple of years, it's done. I mean, a typical plastic bag is, uh, has a lifetime of a minute before it's tossed. Um, <clears throat> something like um, some of these other consumer goods, you'll see as you go across here, these are applications in which um, the durability is longer, like construction materials. So this is, I think, a useful graph and certainly speaks to why a lot of you are here, I think. <clears throat> um, textiles, we've been learning a lot about fibers. Um, polyesters are now the dominant textile fiber by a long way. Um, so here's polyester, more than half of all fibers produced. Um, cellulose, um, even cotton based materials, and cellulosics like rayon and viscose are significant, and wool is Hard, hard to see on this scale. Um, the size of the market for the fibers, this is in billions of dollars, this is just in the US. So it's about $90 billion in the US only, and it's a much larger worldwide market than that, obviously. <clears throat> okay. Um, why the different types of things, like all polyethylenes are not the same. Um, here's low density polyethylene. It's largely used to make film like garbage bags and the clear film that you see wrapped around products when they're shipped and, and whatnot. Um, you'll see other versions like coating, things like over wire for a household electrical wiring and so forth. Um, it's very low density. Now, high-density polyethylene, by the way, low-density polyethylene is, here's the main chain, and it has branched points along the way. High-density polyethylene, in contrast, tends to have far fewer branch points. This permits the chains to nuzzle up against each other more and form more better-performing materials. Even though we call it high-density, it's hardly high. It's barely higher than low-density but it's higher than low density, it's called, so that's HDPE. Principally, polyethylene is processed by extrusion processes, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, when you have materials that can align like this and pack, you tend to see a lot of injection molding processes, which are one, another extremely common form. Um, so here's what a, an injection molder looks like. The plastic nurdles or pellets go in here. They're conveyed along a heated chamber to melt and compress them and being pushed into a mold to produce these various parts. Think of a Lego, if you'd like, as an example of that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there is, there is an example of an injection molding. Extrusion, on the other hand, looks very much the same. It comes down and um, into this screw assembly and pushes a, the molten plastic through a die and creates a continuous product. This is great for making like water pipes and, and 
other, other things, 3D pure filament, for example. Um, so these are two very common extrusion pro uh, plastics processing equipment. This is why melt processing is so important. These are thousands of pounds of pressure in these. So some, one of these injection molding presses can literally have 100 tons of force clamping the, the two halves of the mold together because of the, the enormous viscosity of these long chains. So it's very specialized equipment. <clears throat> okay, a little pause from all the chemistry. Breathe. Very good. Um, it's a couple few questions for you to think about. As we go from these long list of synthetic uh, products or materials to bioplastics, are they greener? Are they better? Um, we'll start to try to address a couple of those. <clears throat> um, Bioplastics have a defined minimum content of bio-origin bio material. I'm not going to get into the details of that. But a lot of this is driven by businesses re recognizing interests like yours that people want products that are safer for the environment, they can feel better about purchasing and using. Okay. And there's a lot of added value, so the biomaterials trend is growing quite fast, about 20% a year across the world. Um, so some examples, some bioplastics. The most common uh, polylactic acid derived from corn, but not, corn does not produce PLA, corn produces starch, which is, can be converted into a lactide that can be polymerized into polylactide. So that doesn't sound as bio as you might have thought. Um, the polyhydroxyalkanoates, or PHAs, are a family of materials that are produced naturally by bacteria, certain types of bacteria. Some, some of the, sometimes as much as 50% of the body mass of the bacterium can be this polymer that they use it to store energy, like we do use glycogen in our, in our bodies. Um, and you can see all, both these materials are what are called polyesters, and they're aliphatic chains. Another type of one is a modified starch. We all know about starch from corn or tapioca or rice or uh, there are lots of sources. Uh, cassava. Um, it's abundant plant material, but it can't be melt processed unless you chemically modify it. Same for cellulose. Um, well, these were on the synthetic list, right? Polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, scientists have figured out ways of making these through bio routes from uh, plant or microbial origins. Um, but these are no more degradable than the synthetic versions of the same molecules. They're the same molecules, they can't be different. Um, these bioplastics, nonetheless, are growing at about 20% per year. So even though they're a tiny fraction of the overall market, they're growing very fast. Um, I want to kind of finish with a story of a kind of a topic um, that you might not have thought about for plastics. And this is turned out to be a very fast-growing application of plastics. And <clears throat> I want you to, I'm going to try to convince you of the truth of this statement, because um, it sounds ridiculous to make, make this claim. But materials are not inherently biodegradable or not biodegradable. It's entirely dependent upon context completely dependent upon context. Um, <clears throat> so I remembered as I was preparing for this a story I read many, many years ago about some sunken logs in Lake Superior that were old growth timber that had fallen into the lake. We're sitting at the bottom of the lake about 60 feet down in an oxygen deficient environment, kept cold, beautifully preserved, straight grain, old growth red oak. So that material, you'd think a tree should, is, surely is biodegradable. But it's not under those circumstances. How about a peat bog that's thousands and thousands of years old? It's mostly, there are a lot of it's cellulose, which we certainly think of as a biodegradable material. But it's not under those circumstances. Okay. <clears throat> so agriculture is starting to use plastic 
a lot by in like uh, on the order of 10 billion pounds a year. That's with a B, billion pounds a year. We're doing a 10 billion pound a year experiment on planet Earth um, by by using these agricultural bioplastics, or not even bioplastics. Normally, they're not bioplastics. Um, so that we're making hoop houses um, to get kind of localized warming. We're applying plastic in the fields, and for good environmental reasons. Um, you run drip lines underneath plastic, and you'd have lots of benefits. Retain water. Suppress weeds without chemical application. Pest management, greater productivity and yield. You can start planting earlier. Um, but we don't know what's happening to those plastic materials. Uh, China's been using plastics in agricultural for going on 30 years, 30 years. Um, that's polyethylene in a, in a tilled soil. Um, so that's going to get blown away and washed into streams, and that's going to the ocean. That's not a good thing. So they would, and China's, they need to feed a lot of people. China and other people want to do this, and they'd like to be able to till the material into the fields rather than, and have it degrade. So I'm going to take just a minute to talk you through how this could degrade, and then I'm going to give you some reason for optimism, and then I'm going to call it good. Um, so when we have these plastic materials, they are very slow degraders in the, the natural environment. In seawater, it's pr worse than in soil, in fact. Uh, there's just fewer opportunities for bacteria, for example, in seawater. Um, so full mineralization is conversion of that carbon into carbon dioxide and methane, um, hopefully carbon dioxide, because methane's a terrible greenhouse gas. Um, you need kind of weak bonds or accessible bonds for the biological action to take effect. So you can have biological methods or modes of attack of the, on the polymer or plastic, and then you can have non-biological ones, weathering and mechanical agitation, and this result, results in size reduction, but the plastic doesn't really go away, it just gets smaller, as we've learned. Um, <clears throat> rather than have you look at all that, I want you to see the con a context. Oops, our, looks like our slide advancer has stopped here. Let's start again. Oh, what a shame. It locked up on me. There we go. Is it working now for you? Good. Um, In between things like, on the left, on your right, rather, the carbohydrate materials and the classic olefinic materials like polyethylene, we have, this thing's locked up again, I think, there we go. We have some middle materials. And I want you to, sorry, um, there we go. So some materials are labeled as biodegradable. Here's a taterware. Um, and early versions of this product were poor degraders. They've gotten better with time. Okay. Um, but we all have to fight our, the possibility of greenwashing as we start to th label things as biodegradable. Um, so this is from a plastics association, which is the industrial... Uh, group in Washington, D.C. They literally have a K Street address in Washington, D.C. They're warning their, their business association against using improper labeling because so many people are getting burned and the whole idea of degradable plastics is getting a bad name as a consequence. So care in our language, I think, is, serves us all. I'm going to stop with two slides, one on Differences in rates of recycling of, I know there's a recycling talk later, 
Uh, metals are recycled at about 90% rate, plastics at about 9% rate. Um, plastics exist in a little narrow band of density, metals over a wider band. Metals can be separated using electrical and magnetic properties, plastics not so much. Um, so it's a much more challenging waste management problem. Um, now for the optimism. Some little local optimism. 30 years ago this year, uh, the city of Bellingham started curbside pickup. This was started by civic-minded groups like the League of Women Voters and local volunteers. Since the day one, Bellingham has had segregated waste. Paper in one, waste paper, plastic cans, glass in another, newsprint in another. Now we also have food waste, of course. Um, this far-sighted uh, work means Bellingham's plastic waste is less than 1% contaminated. So our waste is actually a resource. So we should be, feel good about that. Um, we're one of the few places that does segregated waste pickup. And I think that's something we probably all should be doing. Um, other reasons for optimism. Places like Europe that have harmonized labeling and, and demands on recycling are improving quite a bit faster than we are. A lot of our local communities are actually stopping with recycling plastic programs because of China's decision to stop accepting our crummy waste. Another reason for optimism, I just took this picture this week at Western's campus, two young women who had just wrote a successful grant to install three new water refill stations on campus. The bags of rice represent, each grain of rice represents a bo water bottle that didn't have to be purchased because there was centralized high quality water for people to fill up their reusable water bottles. Two million bottles saved. <clears throat> Examples like at Purdue University, uh, Penn State University, Washington State University, converting waste plastic into fuel resources or regenerating the monomers. And I'm going to start, or I'm going to finish this with what looks like a horrific graphic rather than an optimistic one, which is the, the circles represent the size of the plastic waste, and then the red represents the fraction of the, it which is mismanaged. The biggest fraction of mismanagement is South Asia. Um, but w there have been the developed systems, the reason for optimism, developed systems can properly manage these plastic waste that ultimately end up in the oceans. So there are solutions out there that can be implemented relatively quickly, and we should be doing those things. That's the low-growing fruit. We should also not take too much credit for being advanced because we, we only recycle about 10% of our plastics. We can do a lot better. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. So if you have a question, let me come over to this side of the room. Coming quickly, oh, trying to get there. There we go. You didn't mention hemp plastic, and I'm wondering if people know about that. It is completely recyclable, and China is growing it by far more than we are, because they never had the prohibition that we put in because of corporate interests. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. It pulls toxins out of the soil, endless benefits. So hemp is principally cellulosic material. So in the broad sweep of things, it is not a melt possible plastic because cellulosics are not. However, it can be chemically modified to be melt, to spun into fibers at least, and used to make some plastic materials. However, that's not the same as the raw hemp. Um, but it is a resource for cellulosics and it can be a very low uh, carbon footprint plant to grow, and so it could be an advantageous material, but it probably will never be in the quantities we've been talking about. But it can be used as a fiber for reinforcement, too, and it is certainly a natural product, but it has to be chemically modified, like starches and the cellulose, to be kind of industrially processed. 
We have time for one more question. I'm hearing the word chemical and chemically repeated several times so far this morning. Are there chemicals that we need to be as conscious of as the plastics? I think we have a speaker coming later today who's going to talk about additives in, uh, in plastics and toxicity. Um, so I don't want to take away from that. Um, plastics do have lots of additives, can have lots of additives. Colorants, um, they can have things like glass added to them to add reinforcement and improve some things like thermal stability. Um, there can, some of those things are not very toxic. Others um, are, would be following the same idea as a bad idea. Um, and so I think it spans the range. People are becoming more attuned to this. Okay, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you, Dr. Perrin. <laughs>